two-time Emmy-nominated producer, Frank Pace, and retired New York City firefighter, 9-11 first responder, and Vietnam vet, Billy O'Connor. Today's guest, the acclaimed film director and columnist, Mel Damsky. My brother, my brother Frank, how you doing? How you doing? I'm doing all right. I'm just uh, I'm getting fed up of looking for movies. You know, like I, uh, I'm looking at Hulu. I'm looking at Netflix. I'm looking at Amazon Prime. And every time you put it up, it's the same 12 across the top. New movies. People are watching this. I, I'm just, I guess I'm, I'm watching too many movies. Oh, I've seen this, seen that, seen that. But it's because they're going off of your profile. Why don't you, if you put on Jenny's profile, there'll be 12 other movies. Really? <laughs> <laughs> Really? Really? I never thought of that. Oh my God, I'm so glad I got you. Oh shit, I never thought of that. Frank, I come from, I come from an era when it was three channels, you know what I mean? And they went off at one o'clock in the morning and you had the syncopated rhythm for the late show. You yeah. Know? And, da, the, da, 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 and and, and the, the, your your father's remote was your head. Like, yeah, exactly. Go, go change the channel. Asshole. Go get that. <laughs> change yeah. the channel. Well, I didn't know that. So if I put in somebody on the promo, I get different movies? Yeah. Well, that's terrific. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the 21st century, asshole. Oh, you're, that's amazing. You're a beauty. Oh, yeah. Man. You're a beauty. So you know what I did? I was in desperation. How would I know what you did? You haven't told I'm me yet. I'm going to tell you now. Please. Please. He asked me to please. <laughs> I watched uh, Steven Spielberg's West Side Story. Uh-huh. Right? Only because, I, I mean, it didn't do well at the box office, but it's Spielberg, right? Yeah. And I figured, you know, what, what about 12 Academy Awards the first time around? I don't, they haven't, it hasn't won any yet because no, not they, the, haven't, they haven't awarded the Academy Awards. The Award original yet. West Side Story. Okay. Was, well, you know, Leonard Bernstein, you know, so, genius. So, Montague's and the Cap Capulets, you know. Okay, it's, so. It's, uh, so I watched it. People of Puerto Ricans dancing around New York in the 50s. Exactly. When they were a lot of resentment about large influx of Puerto Ricans coming into New York during the sure. 50s. You know, so. A natural thing, and then of course the love story is Romeo and Juliet. By the way, before you go ahead, speaking of directors, we got a, a terrific guest, guest today by the name of Mel Damsky, Academy Award-winning director, uh, Emmy-nominated director. Uh, so speaking of speaking Spielberg, has a good segue to. Sorry, sorry to interrupt, brother, but go ahead. Can you finish your story? No, well, yeah. Well, speaking of that, we got this director coming out who should have done West Side Story because I tell you the truth. I, I didn't get Spielberg's whole interpretation of it. Like, I mean, I, I, I the music is great. Leonard Bernstein did the music originally. Why would you remake a movie like that? To me, it's like remaking Dr. Zhivago or Large of Arabia. It's a classic. It's done. Leave it up there. Let it go. Because Spielberg wanted to. But it died at the box office, right? Of course. we have. You have perfectly dressed Puerto Ricans in beautifully manicured clothes, dancing around the streets of New York as Steel versus perception of it would have been, uh, and it's not a place in time for musicals. Uh, yeah, you're right. That's a tough sell a musical, especially an iconic musical like West Side Story. I mean, Spielberg has earned the right to do whatever he wants. Without a doubt, if he wants to remake Jaws, fine, he could remake Jaws. But he, uh, in my opinion, he would be the first one to be critical of anybody tried to remake Jaws. Because he made the perfect movie. So uh, why didn't he just leave West Side Story alone? Because it was probably the perfect movie. Do you think, as a producer, and somebody who has an eye, you think for talent or for what's going to be successful, do you think a, a, a play like Oklahoma could make it on Broadway today? No. Not a chance. Uh, on Broadway? Yeah. Yeah. I, it could make it on Broadway, but it couldn't remake the movie. Because, you know, Broadway people like nostalgic they like going back they like musicals the, you know they are more discerning so if they go if you go back in time and remake a, a classic the music is what's driving it but in a feature when you put movie in, put put music back to back to back it doesn't fly no and, and for the younger audience Especially, I I got the gird now too. <laughs> it's contagious. I got the gird. Everybody, my gird. Everybody's getting my gird. Everybody, get the gird. everybody knows about God the gird. Damn, get the gird. Yeah, of course. I never, you know, I didn't. I wasn't nine nine eleven first responder like you, so I don't have an excuse. Stop uh, eating olives. Yeah, uh, but uh, you know, movies are a younger audience. Where theater goers are an older audience, and I believe older older audiences get it more 
So, musicals. I mean, all of those classic musicals from the 50s and 60s, you know, whether it's Oklahoma, whether it's uh, uh, Music Man or uh, uh, Car yeah, Carousel. They, they, you know. they all do well. They, 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 they all get remade eventually. Well, I think they get remade on, on like... On Broadway. Yeah, uh, what do they call summer stock and stuff like that. Well, yeah, but no, but yeah, yeah I, I think they remake, they remake them up broad. They would sell tickets to that nowadays. Sure, Rogers and Havisty, sure, things. yeah, really big. Yeah. Music Man's opened on Broadway two weeks ago, a month Get ago. Get out of here! Of Again? course, okay, of course. Hugh Hugh Jackman. Uh, oh, really? Is the lead? Yeah, well, I don't like what Spielberg did with the West Side Story. I thought it was, you know, it was all right. It was there. You know what? He, he could, don't care. He could give a shit. He don't care what he, I think. He could give a shit. <laughs> and I bet you that prick eats a sandwich and he doesn't repeat it. <laughs> I bet you he gets it down, Frank. Yeah, so I mean, I, 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 in desperation, I was searching. But you said this Reacher thing is worth seeing. Well, I, I haven't said it yet, but I'm going to ask you. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to ask you if you've seen, if you've seen Reacher. <laughs> the one like it much, much, much better. <laughs> Cool. <laughs> Since I'm able to take this clairvoyant moment, maybe I yeah. can push it through a little bit. Ooh, I like yeah. the have have you seen Reacher? No, Frank. Tell me about it. Well, I wow. I can't really tell you about it if you haven't seen it. But it's, it's, a, it's a story about a six foot four inch giant who lands in uh, who's a ex marine, ex green beret, ex secret service. He. It yeah. used to be John Wayne. <laughs> it, 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 it is John Wayne in his time. It right. was it was Bruce Bruce Willis in his time, right, right. Uh, and he lands in a southern city, a uh, little town in Georgia, and uh, there are uh, a number of murders going on. He, he was he was arrested for the murder on the first time, and then they they realized that he could help them solve the case, and with a uh, with the help of a very attractive uh, young actress. Uh, and a very, very, very talented young black actor uh, who plays the sheriff. Uh, they solved the case. But it's it, it's a great episode, eight episode story. It's total fiction, right? I mean, we, we're talking about a black sheriff in Southern Town. Well, <laughs> Sydney, it's fiction, right? Sidney Poitier pulled it off. <laughs> what, but he came down. Mr. Tibbs came down to the South. Yeah, and so did this, this, lo Not this the lawyer. Not the black sheriff, he's in town. No, right? the black. Detective uh -huh. was running away from a bad experience that he had in Boston, so he was a Boston train actor uh, hiding out, uh, Boston train lawyer hiding out, running away from something, and that's why he took the job in Georgia. But it's a it's a terrific terrific series. Yeah, really, I'm gonna check it out. Derek, you didn't you didn't see it? Haven't seen it. No. Who wrote it? I wonder. Let's see. Yeah, well, you know, uh, who's the guy that's tearing it up right now? Is Taylor or something? Around Nick. There? Santora? Nick Santora wrote it. Yeah. Who's the, the, the writer now that's tearing up television? I mean, tearing it up. Yellowstone is Taylor something or other? Yeah. I don't know. Taylor uh, it's not, it's Caldwell. Not, Taylor yeah, Taylor Caldwell. Caldwell. I, I think that's right. Yeah. He's, he's, Caldwell? He's, got, he's got Yellowstone. He's got 1883 and he's got 1933 or something. And he's also got that thing with Jeremy. Uh, what is that? Jeremy. Uh, Jeremy, the older guy with the pug face. <laughs> Renner? Jeremy Renner, yeah. He's got it series with him, too. Great. What's it, Taylor Caldwell? Is that his name? Uh, Who wrote Yellowstone? Yeah, yeah, he's hot, man. That guy's hot as, hot as a pistol. Anything player. else you see? Sheridan? Seen? Sheridan? Taylor Sheridan. Sheridan. That's it. You yeah. seen anything else that piques your, piques your fancy? Oh, uh, what the hell? You know what I watched last night? Because of something that somebody had said on an interview, and I can't remember who said it, but they said you have to see uh, 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 the Giants. Uh, Documentary, you know, uh, what's his name? Uh, Andre the Giant. Andre the Giant documentary. Yeah, that was pretty good. I thought it was hilarious. It I was, thought it was great. It was good. Did you see the part where he's talking about how we had a fixation with flatulation? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> how would Andre the Giant fought it? A whole airplane to clear out? Like he made a lot of noise. Besides that, he got a big kick out of it. I mean, I knew he was a. How long have you been 13? <laughs> <laughs> Fart jokes are part of the time. <laughs> Prolific. I mean, he was. I knew he was an unbelievable drinker. You know, they talked about him being able to drink a case of wine, no problem. You know, like, and you you could see a bottle of beer in his hand. Yeah, looked like an ounce glass. You know, but I had no idea that he had this fixation. But but well, I, I I always say there's two people in the world: people who find humor in farts and people who don't. <laughs> <laughs> You put them in one of two categories. Think yeah, about but, it. 
Think about it. There's farts and then there's damn right hurricanes. I mean, from what I understand, this guy uh, yeah, but look, makes some noise. Look, look. George Clooney obviously finds humor in farts. He just looks like a guy that finds humor in farts. He married a woman who has never farted in her life. <laughs> <laughs> Mel Brooks finds humor in farts, obviously. Yeah, but I think Anne Bancroft found humor in farts also. <laughs> yeah, she was a Bronx girl. She yeah. probably did. Speaking of the Bronx, so Derek, can you get Mel Damsky, uh, Academy Award winner and Emmy-nominated director, uh, on the line? A Bronx guy. Let's, let's Bronx talk guy. to him. Hey, hey, Mel. How you doing, pal? Great. Wonderful to be here. That's my partner, Billy O'Connor. Pleasure to meet you. And that's my other partner, Derek pleasure. Harris. Absolute Hi. pleasure. Nice to meet you both. So, what are you doing with yourself these days? Well, that's a really good question. I don't know if you heard, there's this COVID thing going around. <laughs> uh, so, um, it's been, but I have a, a puppy. And she's been a lifesaver for me, keeping me busy. I also uh, wrote my first play. I'm 75 years old. And it's going to debut in Santa Rosa, California. And I'm creating a directing program at School of Visual Arts in New York starting in September. So I'm staying busy. NYU? Uh, well, no, this is called School SVA, School of Visual Arts. But I'm also talking to NYU about teaching the Tisch. Uh, the following year, because a lot of people at Tisch are retiring now. Yeah, and you're just starting. You're, and you're, you're a newcomer. I, I don't act my age. So. Yep. Uh, yeah. You didn't act your age about two years ago when you directed seven movies for Lifetime. Is that right? The Hallmark. Hallmark. 11, 11 movies. Wow. And how short a period of time? Four years. How? That's It's, it's amazing to me how you could get yourself so up to do 11 movies because each one of those you you were doing them like you were doing it for for the first time it, weren't yeah, you of course yeah and uh but i like to be busy you know uh when you're adhd like i am directing is a really wonderful profession because you're on your feet all the time you're surrounded by lots of different people new challenges all the time so it was very tough for me when sh things shut down you can imagine. Yeah, 11 movies in four years. That's incredible. But what cracks me up is your freshman year of college, you knew you wanted to be a director. How many people? No, I you? didn't. I was always going to be a, a, a sports writer. I was a yeah, I was sports editor of my high school and college paper. My uncle is a very famous journalist who inspired me. I always thought I was going to be a journalist. And I just wanted to get, I was a reporter for Newsday in New York, and I just wanted to get out of New York because all my friends were doing drugs, about, you know, in the late 60s. <laughs> yeah. Did you, right? did you did you run into Billy then? <laughs> no, I didn't. I was, well, I was you know, in New York <laughs> in the late 60s, too, and I wanted to get out of doing drugs, so I went to Vietnam. I thought, there, what's the odds of them yeah. having drugs in Vietnam, you know? Yeah. And so I wanted to get out of there. I went to grad school in Denver. Uh, thinking I would go back and be a film critic like Joe Gelmus was. In, uh, and my very first day of grad school, they told me what a director did. And I said, that's what I want to do. What a cool job. And you were born in the Bronx, weren't you? I was born in the Bronx, but lived in Manhattan. Billy's my parents are uh, German immigrants. They met in New York. And uh, we moved to Long Island when I was a year and a half old. So you were out in Roslyn, right? That's uh, my father's place is out there, right? The, the bar. That's right. Yes. Yeah, well, you know, I, I, I was in the bar business in Queens, and they were one of my rivals, my father's place. So I used to go out there and steal their bands occasionally. Out in Roslyn. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. My father is, speaking of my father's place, my father's place was a jewelry store right across from the clock tower called the Silver Bell. Right in town, huh? That's a uh, Billy Joel yeah. country too, isn't he from around it? Yeah, he was. He's from Long Island. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So you went to Colgate on a football scholarship? Yes, believe it or not. Look at me. I'm you know a little old Jewish person, but uh, I didn't know that at the time. Uh, and I was a linebacker. I played against Larry Zonka freshman year. He played Whoa, for Syracuse. Syracuse. I played for Colgate. And, uh, so, you know, freshman year, I was okay. I was the captain. Sophomore year, 
I realized that everybody was way bigger than me and much better. And in practice one day, uh, I played middle linebacker. The, our quarterback rolled out, and I knew, I knew what he was doing. I went with him, Bob Mark, and he ran over me. And he was a Jewish guy from Scarsdale. <laughs> and I said, I just got run over by a Jewish guy from Scarsdale. <laughs> what was he driving? <laughs> <laughs> and I quit, I quit that day. And I went to my coach and I said, this doesn't really make sense, right? I'm, you know, I'm 5'8", 175 pounds. But I did continue to wrestle because wrestling, you pick on people your own size. So, so by... By 1978, you were directing in Los Angeles your first movie? Or oh, before that. Is that what's showing up on my IMDb? It's Long long Journey Back. Oh, yeah. That was the first movie, yeah. I did some series before that, but yes. I went to AFI after University of Denver and uh, had a – they had a um, – there was a very famous producer named Quinn Martin and Quinn had a policy. He would ask all the best film programs to submit their best picture, their best movie from that year's class. And AFI chose my short and Quinn chose my short. And I went right from AFI to directing an episode of Barnaby Jones. Wow. Now, what year was that? 75, 74? Yeah, it was around 74, 75, yeah. So you went from Barnaby Jones to Lou Grant and then on to Mesh. That's right. Yeah. And, and then I, uh, I got to do some TV movies as well. So I was going back and forth between MOWs. And, you know, there were lots of MOWs back in yeah. those days. What was, and, it like, uh, what was it like walking onto the set of Mesh for the first time? It was a very intimidating to me. But they were very nice to me. I mean, they realized I was a kid and had no idea what the heck I was doing, right? So, but they were really, Alan especially was. Uh, Alan yeah, Radar, Radar was a little bit of a challenge, and they warned me about that. <laughs> but, but uh, hey, Radar, if you're watching, I'm sorry, you know. <laughs> Radar, if you're watching, I'm glad you <laughs> we got you watching. You worked with <laughs> yeah. Alan Old and Harry Morgan. Now, I got to tell you, Harry Morgan, to me, delivers my favorite line in the history of the movies when he made my darling Clementine when Henry Fonda, he plays the bartender. And of course, Henry Fonda comes in and tells him he's in love with Clementine and he says to the bartender, which is to me as a bartender was a great line. He says, Joe, have you ever been in love? And Harry Morgan looks at him and says, no, I've been a bartender all my life. <laughs> I just love that line. So working with Harry Morgan, I mean, that must have been a hell of a kick for a young kid. Oh, it was, it, it, again, it was a little intimidating, but they were so nice to me and made me feel very comfortable. Well, and uh, it was a really good experience. But the, the, the thing that really changed things for me was Lou Grant because I had a background as a journalist, and a lot of the directors uh, on Lou Grant, right, came from the Mary Tyler Moore show, which was a multiple camera show. I was more of a movie type director. And so I got the show on its feet. You know, there were all the scenes were written where they were always sitting at their desk, talking at their desk. I got them up and moving, you know, they pull out something out of their typewriter, they take it over to deliver it to this part of the thing, you know, that kind of thing. And I got it on its feet. And obviously when it had to get very serious, I would stop and have close ups. But they really loved what I did. And when they saw my first couple of days at dailies, they hired me for four more episodes. Now, is that because so motion that, that, works so well in television, Frank? That's because motion works so well in single camera, especially. You, yeah. Because it, you it know, wasn't it, static. It wasn't static, right. And it, it, there's motion in situation comedies, too, but they got four cameras to cover that were, were Mel with. Well, also in a very limited set. Yeah. You know, in, in most, right? If you have a live audience, you don't have a big set. Yep. So yep. I had a lot of room to work with. I could do a 360 if I needed to. Now, you were just a kid. Was this instinctive in your part or just Or did you learn to do AFI? Yeah, and I think I've been, always have been a good storyteller, and that's what it's about. When I teach directing, I very first day I go, a director is blank. And the right answer is a storyteller. 
It's not about technology. It's about what's the best way to tell this story. Yeah, I I remember seeing a, a war movie with Howard Morris, who was one of my mentors. And I said, Howie, how the hell do you shoot something like that? And he said, one shot at a time. And that <laughs> when he told me that, I figured I, I could direct. Because if you worried about one shot at a time, you got the essence of what you're trying to capture at that very moment. And it's all, it's all about the shot you're in, uh, not the next shot. Is that, is, would you agree with that? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yes, absolutely. That makes sense. Yeah. Let me probably ask both of you guys this question as a layman. Is, is a director, uh, is, if his vision is different than the script, he has to stick to the script, right? He has to adhere to it. I mean, he's not, he ain't got the final say on his vision, does he? That's a very good point. If it's episodic TV as a guest director, you're not going to, it's going to be very hard for you to get them to rewrite the script. And, you know, if you're working for, for a David E. Kelly, who I admire tremendously, you don't have to even do that. I mean, every once in a while, even with a David E. Kelly show, I would make a suggestion. And, you know, once in a while, maybe they would actually take me up on it. But there were some showrunners who, uh-uh, this is the Bible. You don't mess with it. Showrunners in television, but in episodic television, but in features, the director's the king. That's right. And even in, in MOWs, the director has more clout than in series television. Uh, yes. MOW is? Movie of the Week. Movie, Movie of the, of the Week. week. I, say. I, I have a question, a follow-up question, because this is one of my questions for later, uh, regarding the uh, – director being king as a director can you fix a bad or, or poorly written script and, and make it into a good movie yes and in fact uh i would make that a condition for accepting you can't do that on episodic television because you've already committed to that slot right and when your time comes up you get a script and i mean you can give notes but you you hope for the best but on a movie of the week i would not accept the job unless they agreed to taking my notes. When you went on to do work with people like Carl Malden and a uh, personal favorite of mine, James Mason, uh, that must have been, I mean, how old were you when that started going about? How long were you in the business when that when that came up that you started? I was it? pretty raw. I mean, I, I wasn't intimidated, but I was uh, honored is the word to use. I was honored to be able to work with that kind of person. Yeah. You know, the James Mason. Uh, yeah, Mason, uh, Mason made a movie called Odd Man Out, which was when I was first enamored with Mason, because I'm Irish, and it was a movie about the IRA, you know, and he was a yeah. fugitive on the run. An early, really early movie for Mason, 47, 48, I think it was made. So, uh, what I mean, uh, unbelievable. Brilliant actor, you know, just brilliant. So uh, as a young kid, I think I would have been super intimidated. How do you direct a guy like that, you know? Well, you, you've got to have some self-confidence to be a director. <laughs> I mean, you know, you're you're the... Well, you're a Bronx you're guy. you got balls. I know that. you got some balls. You're for the Bronx. Yeah. you got to have some balls if you're there. And I think it probably helped that I was a football and wrestling star in, in high school and had some confidence. Yeah. You know, I wasn't easily intimidated. Well, that leads us to Yellowbeard. Uh, what was the story of Yellowbeard? Because that was, that was not your, that wasn't your first film, feature film, was it? It was my first feature film, okay, yes. Okay, it came before Mischief then. So, <coughs> which was a great, Mischief was a great movie, but what about Yellowbeard? What can you tell us? Yellowbeard, I was basically a sacrificial lamb because uh, it wasn't a Monty Python movie per se. It was an Orion movie, and Mike Metavoy didn't want it to be as broad as a Monty Python movie. And so he insisted that the Pythons did not direct it themselves and that they had to bring someone in. But they found this young kid who was pretty new uh, to do it, and that was me. And uh, it was a real struggle, I can tell you, with in many ways because the pythons would want to ad lib all the time cheech and chong would want to ad lib all the time which they did in their own movies 
And the studio said, no, they have to stick to the script. And I had to be the messenger that was being blamed for giving that note to them all the time. Did you, have uh, to, did you get a chance to throw them a bone every now and then and say, okay, you got, you did it straight. Now you can. Oh yeah. Pass. No, no, absolutely. I, uh, I could, I would say you got to do one per the script. And then once we print that, you can do whatever the F you want. And, it, you know, and who knows, maybe uh, if I put it in my cut, maybe they'll accept it, but I have to have one take for the books for the script. Yeah. Who was the biggest screwball in that whole group? And, and was there any animosity between them being British and you being German or you being American and being a Yank and them being British? Or any, any hassle was, with that? There was just, they just weren't happy that they, you know, that this kid they came were, in and was directing when they always directed their own movies. Uh -huh. You know, it was really not, not a fun gig, I will tell you that. And then, as if that wasn't enough, Marty Feldman died while we were shooting in Mexico. His wife would not let him see a Mexican doctor. She lived in L.A. And uh, just very sadly, he died on, you know, on location in Mexico. And did you, did you have to finish that movie without him? Obviously, you had to finish that movie without him, but... Had you I did. All I had scenes? to invent an ending in which his stunt double falls into this water and drowns. And, uh, you know, my du the double looked enough like him in the distance that I got away with it. If you watch the movie, you'll see what I'm talking about. Yeah. You think he could have been saved had it not been his wife's aversion to the Mexican doctor? You think it would have been, could have saved his life if he would have went to a Mexican doctor? Who knows, but. The point is, he, he needed the help right then. Yeah. Couldn't wait till the movie was over and they were back in Beverly Hills. But onto a happier movie, Mischief followed Yellowbeard, didn't it? Shortly thereafter. Yes. And that Mischief been... was, a, I loved it. Kelly Preston, Doug McKeon. Uh, Kelly very sadly died recently at age 59. She, who's listening to this? Can I tell some? You can, yes, you by all that. means, and First Amendment all the way. So feel free to use any figure of speech you want or no worries. Kelly was uh, engaged to a young man who I called Thumper. Our motel rooms were back to back. Our, our bed frames were back to back. Thumper. <laughs> and they would keep me up all night <laughs> stripping away. Stopping. <laughs> And I said, guys, you can't do that. And I, I called him Thumper. <laughs> I say, how's things going with Thumper? So, and, and uh, was he an actor on a movie? No, he was uh, just a guy. And she was from Hawaii originally. And then she married him. And that didn't last very long. Then she married Travolta. Yeah, that, that's when she stopped thumping. <laughs> <laughs> Truth be told, <laughs> she was been thumping with somebody else because she wasn't thumping with John. Yeah. So <laughs> that was no comment. But, and by the way, I think Doug McKeon was a virgin. You know, he was like sixteen or something like that. And so he, he actually had his first sex on a movie set, right? <laughs> Before he had it in person. And in getting paid life. for that too, and getting paid for it. Yeah. <laughs> And he was a real sweet kid, and we were in a great little town in Ohio. I just, it was a really wonderful experience for me. Yeah, because then we did a Winner Never Quits, which I don't see on your filmography. Uh, but it was. It isn't? Uh, not on this. Not on this. Really? Maybe on IMDb, but it's not on Wiki. I want to say one more thing about Mischief. Check out the songs that we got for that movie. Unbelievable. Well, oh, unbelievable. 50, 50 songs, right? Unbelievable. But incredible movies, um, incredible songs. We could never afford to do that now. Never. never. You're but right. in those days, in the 80s, they didn't care about songs from the 50s. Well, so I got to use these amazing songs. Well, that reminds me of something I haven't thought about for 30 years. But we got the Slits commercial because of that movie. 
because we did a, I'm, Mel's thinking about what the hell is he talking about Schlitz commercials. But if you recall, we did a series of three or four 15 second commercials for Schlitz beer, which were all set in the fifties. And we used background music from uh, the fifties as the tracks. Do you remember that at all? You're asking me that? Yeah. No, I'm asking myself. Of course I'm asking you. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't. <laughs> so, was there wait, an wait, album wait, of that wait. soundtrack then? I guess there was wait an a album. Wait a minute. Who are you again? Wait <laughs> <laughs> a second. Bill. Bill. No. Bill. Bill. <laughs> <laughs> so did, was there a set that, was an album cut of that soundtrack uh, from the 50s? No. It no. wasn't. They they did not appreciate it at the time. You know, it just it's only in looking back that uh, they, I think people realize what an amazing soundtrack we had. You don't really remember those those fifteen second commercials we did for Schlitz. I do. I oh. do remember Schlitz. Yes. Yes. Good, Good answer. <laughs> yes. Uh, so then we did a winner never quits with uh, Pete Gray, Mayor Winningham. Uh, the story of Pete Gray, Keith Carradine played uh, Pete Gray, Mayor Winningham, yeah. Ed O'Neill, Dana Delaney. Uh, who else was in that movie? That was a, quite a cast. Fanula Flanagan. And uh, Frank used to, I actually played in a, a an actual baseball game. Uh, remember, Frank? Yeah, well, a little backstory. We, were, we shot the movie in two places. We shot the movie in Chattanooga, Tennessee, to double as Memphis, and we shot the movie in Long Beach. So this was one of our eight days in Chattanooga, and Mel was invited to play in a celebrity all-star game. Uh, so continue there from there. And so if I didn't swing in a pitch, I would hear from Frank, good eye, Mel. Not for me. <laughs> Not for me. I didn't say that. There was a voice from the stands, a discombobulated voice from the stands would yell out, good eye, Mel. Yeah, who was that? But then you picked up on it. And whenever <laughs> I get a good shot in the movie, you'd say, good eye, Mel. And I continue to say it to this day. I, I, I yeah. always greet Mel with, good eye, Mel. <laughs> I, I don't know whether you remember or not, but Pete Gray was the one on outfield of Billy, and uh, I was, I was, the, I had my first job as an associate producer on that movie, and I was one of the things I could do was hit fly balls to Keith, and he would, he would catch him with one hand and then flip the glove under his arm and throw it back in. Well, one day, I knocked a bird out of the sky. Keith Keith went over and a bird went in, went in front of him and. Uh, that was the end of that bird. It was sort of like the Randy Johnson, oh, the Randy Johnson, Randy Johnson yeah, pitch, that he blew up a bird. Uh, but it was it was incredible. Uh, that that shoot was a very hard shoot because it was really hot that summer. Uh, do you recall the 105 yeah. degree days playing baseball? But also think about it. You had a pitcher in Tennessee. Pitching to a batter in Long Beach. Yes. Why don't you tell, explain to Billy and Derek what we mean by that? What I mean is we everything toward the field was shot in Tennessee. Everything toward home plate was shot in Long Beach because we didn't have the proper stands we needed wow. uh, in Tennessee. So it was, you know, we had to really be very careful wow. about connecting the dots directing a movie on zoom basically you were doing it in two different locations that's right exactly so yeah we, we had to meticulously storyboard out every sequence and mel would go to the storyboard to see what we shot in tennessee and then how it, how it would match to what we would shoot in los angeles right there was no going back to tennessee if i missed a shot nope wow nope so and sort of Damocles hanging over you there when you're doing that job, huh? I and, mean, no mistakes. <laughs> and if you, recall, yes. if you recall, we had Armin Katayan in that movie also as the left as the left fielder, Phil Canzoni, uh, who, who made a terrific catch, uh, a circus catch, and he hurt himself. And then Phil Canzoni had to come out, and Pete Gray went in to save the day. Uh, it, was, it was a terrific movie. 
Uh, on that movie, you recall Danny Blatt, who you later worked with, or who he had worked with before on Badge of the Assassin. Dan right. was Dan was a, a, an incredible character in the in, in the best sense of the words. Uh, we tried to hire a young actor to play second base named Les Moonves. And well, Andy Hill didn't want to hire him, did he? Do you recall that story? I do, of course. Can you tell it? Yeah, Les worked with friends of mine. He was an, uh, an assistant to them. He was just starting out in the industry, but also wanted, wanted to be an actor. And he and I were, good, were buddies. And uh, it wasn't easy to get him in there. And then he became one of the most powerful men in television. He was the head of CBS at one he time? Was, he was the president, yes. the chairman of the board of CBS. Chairman of the board of yeah. CBS. Now you said he started out as an assistant. That's a gopher, basically? Yeah, yeah. But the, the assistants are the most powerful people in Hollywood because they control who has access to their boss. <laughs> oh, yeah, well. <laughs> they are the most powerful people in show true. business. That's so, true. So as, as I recall, the payoff to the story, which... I don't know whether you know or not, Mel. You you would know it if you read our book, If These Lips Could Talk. But the pay of that story was Andy Hill was the was a, a, a an executive at Columbia, and he nixed Les being in the movie. He said, I don't want Les to be in the movie. Years later, Les transitioned from Warner Brothers to CBS, and I was in a meeting with Les. And Barnett Kelman, our mutual friend, who was directing, uh, uh, what was the name of that show? Uh, I'm, mad, I'm mad as hell, and I'm not going to take it anymore. What's that? Network. Called? Network. We were doing a television pilot of Network, and it was going to be really expensive. And Andy Hill was the president of CBS Films, but he reported to Les. And I think that was the first time Les was in a room with Andy Hill after Andy Hill had nixed him. For being an actor, uh, and we didn't do a budget. We did a budget which was really high. And he says, "Can we do this?" And I said, "We know how, Les. It's time and money." And he said, "And I said we don't have enough of either." And he looked at Andy and he said, "Is this true?" And he said, "Well, yes." And the next day he fired Andy. Whoa, that's the kind of guy Les was. Wow. Yep. Dollar and cents guy all the way, huh? Like a well, it's it not not so much a dollar in a sense guy as a guy who had a he he, he knew it, he, he carried a grudge for for, a, for the longest time. But what was the time frame? Like how long was that? About thirty years. Eight years. years. Eight year, eight nine years between the, the movie and time he that Les took over CBS. Was that right, Mel? Eighty four to ninety two, somewhere like around there. Yeah. Yeah. Mel, how many uh, how many films did you shoot overseas? You've done some work overseas, mostly in Europe, right? Yeah, I shot in England. I shot in um, a little Hungary. bit in Prague, uh, a movie in Budapest, but um, Mexico a, a couple of times, but mostly in the in the U.S. You know, but the fun thing about the MOWs is you did them all over the country. You know. And that was really nice, as opposed to series, right, where you were obviously going to be mostly in Los Angeles or New York. If you had to, re if, if you had to go back on your career, which of those movies or projects would you like to do over again, just because you had the most fun? Oh, for the fun? Yeah. Well, Pete, you know, the baseball one was fantastic, obviously, because I love baseball, so that was really good. Um, okay. I had a lot of fun on Mischief, Little Town in Ohio, which I loved. Um, I've been very blessed. You know, I've done so many things. There's no way I can say, oh, this was my favorite or, or something like that, because I've had so many favorites, uh, really. Uh, I did love working with David E. Kelly because the content was so good. The quality of the writing was so good. And that really meant a lot to me. That was Boston Legal, correct? Picket Fences, Boston Legal, Boston Public. Yeah. 
Yeah, Karen and I, my wife Karen and I, recently started watching Boston Legal again on Hulu from episode one, and it's such a good show. I mean, it's it's almost a perfect show from a standpoint of oh, good. my sense of humor. Uh, Shatner was great. Uh, I gotta check it out. I, 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 yeah, especially when you guys both talking about the writing and as as a journalist. I mean, that's. Uh, as your background in print journalism, I know you've got to respect the good dialogue. You've got to like. Well, I, I know. But it's not just how well the dialogue was. It was about what, what, what the legal cases were about. They were really interesting legal cases. It was just a terrific show. And Shatner and I are still buddies. I heard from him recently. He turned 90. You know, he just went to outer space. He. Uh, <laughs> he he wants me to find a place for him up in the Northwest, like a farm where eventually his kids and grandkids can live when climate change continues to muck things up in Southern California. Yeah, he wants a place to move when he retires. Yeah. <laughs> he will never retire. And how was Spader to work with? Who? James Spader. Um, <clears throat> tricky. Not easy. Not easy. He wasn't. Uh, we didn't have a good relationship. How so? Can you expand that a little bit? Well, he he would be in his dressing room the whole time, and he would come out, you know, just to do that angle or that take, and then he'd leave again. And uh, there was just no Chemistry. personal connection there. And where there was with yeah. Scarrett, Shatner, James Mason, so many wonderful people I worked with, that was not the case here. Yeah. But but the reason I still did it is because the content was so good. Yeah. And I believe Candace Bergen came in, I think, year two and became a principal character, didn't she? That's right. Yeah. She's great. So. She's great. Well, you worked with George Clooney. You worked with uh, Carl Malden. Personal favorite of mine. I always like Malden, especially from Streetcar Named Desire. Of course, that's the first thing that pops to mind when you hear Malden. My first show was Barnaby Jones. And, uh, oh no, what, what did I work with Carl on? What was the first one? Barnaby Jones and Buddy Epson, right? Oh, yes. Yes. yes, yes. Speech of San Francisco with Carl yeah. Malden. That was a Quinn Martin. Oh, yeah, then I did Speech of Quinn... which was Right, which was wonderful. God. And a young Michael Douglas. Michael Douglas, yeah. Young Michael Douglas. Yeah, a young Michael Douglas. That's right. <laughs> now he's his father. Yeah. yeah. He, he really he really he does like look him. like his father. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Izzy Dimsky, right? Isn't that his real name? Kirk Douglas? Yeah. Kirk Douglas. Dimsky. Izzy it's Dimsky. Very, he was very close to my name. It's like a Dimsky. Yeah. He was a, yeah. Rus a Russian Jew. Uh, he's, 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 he's the, Kirk Douglas' yeah. father was a rag man, as a matter of fact. He sold rags. I'm a wagon. That's great. Yeah. In Russia. That's a great American success story. Well, unbelievable. Unbelievable well, success story. Well, guess what? My parents grew up during the Holocaust in Germany. Yes. Mine is a wonderful story. It certainly is. And, and let me ask you a question. When you did Yellowbeard, we talked about it already. I have a, a, a note here, and I, I, and I was having a half-assed argument with Frank, that off hotter is that like did you do in German as well that movie is that what that is because it said you work with Monty Python and it has off hotter on the past it which is German I guess I don't I don't know no we didn't okay no. so that was me <laughs> I I read it wrong did the research wrong whatever that's why I asked Frank about yeah. it yeah so, yeah so uh, in from two thousand six to two thousand what fourteen you work on on a TV series called Psych with Dooley Hill, uh, that must have been an especially gratifying experience because for you to stay at a place for so long, uh, you must have liked that job. That must have been a pretty good job. Best gig I ever had was Psych uh, because I loved the content and I loved the people I was working with. My two leading actors were wonderful, James O'Day. By the way, James O'Day is from Texas and his real name was Rodriguez, but he looked so gringo that his agent said, you can't be Rodriguez. So he became James Roday. Guess what? He, he would have been better off if he stayed Rodriguez. 
Now he's Rodriguez again. Wow. Whoa. And that's because of the change in the industry? Is that, is that exactly. what Exactly. Now it's a, they want, it's an yeah. Asset. Yeah. Wow. It's amazing. It's, it's an, an asset. asset. Now. Well, why don't you tell us and Boulé was wonderful. And it was just a great experience. And Vancouver is a beautiful city. I, I love being there. Yeah. We hooked up in Vancouver when I was doing a George Lopez movie. Uh, and you were doing psych. That was a yeah. good place to see an old friend. Yeah. Yeah, you guys are both in Vancouver. I heard it's a hell of a town. A Vancouver Island? Is that like a... Well, that's not Vancouver. Yeah, but it's... It's across the... Bay. That's not the mainland, yeah. Yeah. That's a big, big island. Yeah, I just got... To, I love to go up to Vancouver myself. I mean, I've tried some travels in Canada, but uh, you guys... I mean, you get to travel all over the world directing, and, and obviously Mexico, Germany, Hungary, Austria... You have any favorite locations? Well, I loved uh, Budapest just because they preserved so much of the old architecture. And so, you know, it was every place you pointed the camera was something really interesting. That's the way uh, Frank and, felt and about that, Moscow. Yeah. As as a director, that was really wonderful for me. And Prague was like that too. Prague is preserved. Uh, parts of Rome have been t totally preserved. So uh, when you go to a place like that, it's really wonderful cinematically. And you won an Academy Award for a documentary you did. Why don't you tell us about that? Uh -oh. Still kicking the fabulous Palm Springs Mollies. And uh, it's a live musical variety show for performers who were 75 years and older and uh, at the Plaza Theater in Palm Springs. They are now reopening the Plaza Theater years later. It's been shut down because of COVID. About four or five of those dancers are still alive and they want to run my movie opening night. Wow. So hopefully that will happen. And then maybe they'll run your play in there after, yeah. after, your, after the movie. Well, they're actually interested in the play too, yeah. What is the play about? This is your first play. You wrote it at 75. You wrote your first play. And what is it about, Mel? What is, uh, what's the play based on? I did a TV show called Scorpion. And I met with the man the show was about. I had dinner with him. And he told me, I said, what are you working on now? And he told me what he's working on. And that's what inspired the play. So the play is about an old Jewish guy who's very discouraged, won't get out of bed. His wife died years ago. His only son is a touring musician who he never gets to see. He's not happy with some of the political things happening in the world. I don't mention any names. And uh, he's got a black nurse who says his name is Max, and the play's called Max and Max. Max, you got to get out of bed. You'll never get healthy this way. And he said, give me one good reason I should get out of this bed. She said, I'll get back to you on that. Her call button goes off and she brings in his new caretaker, who's a robot named C. Max said, no, I had a robot. He was a putz. He didn't even know what the word meant. He was a B and I am a C. And I have been programmed to be compatible with you. We are going to get along just fine. BB says, I'll leave you two alone. She comes back in 15 minutes later. Not only is Max out of bed, but they're both dancing and saying, Copa, Copa, Copa. <laughs> because she knows every musical, right, that Max loves. But here's what the play's about. And this was inspired by the, my meeting with this guy. C wants Max to sign a consent form that when his body gives out, they can preserve his brain in a hard drive. Walter O'Brien is really working on that. It's going to take years to do that. But I said to myself, would I take that deal if somebody offered me that? No friggin' way, right? Until I find out I'm going to have a grandchild. Mm -hmm. yeah. Maybe then I'll sign. And that's what the play is about. You know, it's interesting because uh, Billy's a grandfather. I'm a grandfather. You're a uh, you're not a grandfather, are you? Not you asking me? Yeah. No, I'm not. I've got five kids and no no grandkids. Yeah. Uh, Remember, I'm the child of Holocaust survivors. Can I use the F word? Yes. yes. Sure. Okay. Every 
Jewish kid who's born is a fuck you to Adolf Hitler. Yeah. That's a great fucking sentence. Yep. Yep. But uh, I know Billy and now I, more recently, I want to live forever just to see my grandchildren grow up. I want to see, yeah. I want to see them go to high school. I want to see them graduate from college. So walk down the I aisle. want to walk down the aisle with my granddaughters. Yeah. I know I'm probably not going to do the latter, but if if I can, I'm going to fight my way to be there as long as I can. I want to I want to stay here as long as I can. Yeah, you they can roll you down the aisle when you're you know just a brain. You got to tell fight. your kids to get to work and give another fuck you to Adolf. Is right. So <laughs> exactly. Adolf, a couple of more fuck yous. Is right. That's exactly. Great. Thank you. Uh, yes, and and now you're running a column. Uh, if I ran the zoo, yeah, I write a column for the Laconer Weekly News here, and I've won best in the state a few times, and uh, it's about whatever I want to write about. Isn't which it is great? Really nice. Isn't that great? That's sort of like what this podcast is. Whatever we want <laughs> to talk about, talk, we talk about. Us. Yeah. yeah. What what are they going to do to us? Is, Nothing. Is, is that a weekly mail? That if I ran the zoo, is it a weekly column? It it was originally. Now I'm doing it monthly because I got so busy with uh, other things. But I'm I'm fine doing it monthly. Do you, do you think your history as a journalist and deadlines uh, made it easier for you to be a director because you always delivered on time because of the deadline thing, the pressure? Or? I think it helped me. It is a kind of storytelling, and every when you're a journalist. Almost every day is a different channel. When you show up at the office, you have no idea what you're going to be assigned that day or where it's going to take you. You know, if it's in um, Long Island, at, at, in Garden City, where the office was, you might end up anywhere that day. Yeah, I, I have a theory that, you know, one of the reasons that you see a lot of journalists uh, in broadcast news is because and interviews is because they're so well-rounded because as a journalist, like you said, you don't know what your assignment's going to be. So you might get a, an assignment on nukes. Well, you're going to learn about nukes. Maybe you didn't know anything about it, but you're going to know something about it by the end of that day. Next day might be inner city crime. You're going to know exactly something about right. it. So you're going to be well-rounded. You're going to make, it's going to make it obviously a, a better, a great conversation. So now how, how do you get involved with the Lacan Art Weekly News? Um, when I was doing psych, because I'm an American, I wanted a place in the U.S. to go to on weekends. And I bought a place in this little town of Laconner uh, that was ridiculously affordable for someone who had lived in L.A. for so long and now is working in Vancouver, both very expensive places. And I read the local paper and I walked into the office one day. And I said to the woman, Sandy, who was, uh, ran the paper, uh, I wrote a column, would you be interested in running it? She said, well, we already have a prize winning columnist, but I'll, I'll look at it. She ran it and then she loved it. And then I became a regular weekly column columnist. Even while I was doing psych, I was writing weekly columns. So the Connor is right across the border from Vancouver? Is no, Lacan is more like an hour and a half from the border, somewhere or something like that. But it's in the state of Washington. And it just got voted in one magazine, the best small town in America. It's a very charming town. It's right on a river. The other side of the river is the Indian Reservation. So that's very interesting. And uh, I could get in my car right now and be there in a half hour. And you say an hour and a half from from Vancouver. Yes. Yeah. And and for a while you couldn't get into Vancouver because of COVID, right? Was it a year and a half? You still, couldn't... I haven't I haven't gone because it's a real challenge, and I really missed my friends there. You know, I was there doing a series for eight years. So they're tough on the border now and going into Canada because of COVID. Still tough. On my it's gotten a little better, but it's still a little tricky. Yeah. Eric, you want to ask another question? Yeah, I got a question. A question. Uh, well, first of all, it's a loaded question. The first one is, uh, what? Who's more important, a writer or a director? Well, oh boy, that's like saying which of your kids do you like better. <laughs> um, obviously, if the writer didn't good, do a good job, you wouldn't be there, right? right? 
So in that sense, the writer is more important. But on the other hand, the director can actually totally fuck it up. Right. And so, uh, or raise it to another level in some cases. So that's why directors are more famous than writers. Is it important that a writer and a director develop some kind of relationship or rapport? Or is that not it, ha- it really helps. It really helps to do that. Because for, yeah. the, for the longest time, writers weren't allowed on movie sets, were they? Right. They did not want, especially on MOWs, you know, because when you're doing an MOW, you're getting a lot of the movie of the week. You're getting a lot of notes from the network all the time. You know, when you just had basically three networks doing the MOWs, those people who ran those networks, they were in charge and they had very specific notes that you had to address. So now it's out of the writer's hands completely and it's in the studio's hands and the director's hands. Yeah. And one of the reasons I got hired a lot is because I was also a writer and a lot of times they wanted, they still had a lot of notes and the, the writer of the script had already gone on to another project. So I would do the rewrite while I was prepping the movie. Yeah. And I, I can remember on A Winner Never Quits, Mel was always rewriting that script. He was always yes. rewriting that script and uh, the script was so much better off for it. Wow. So yeah, you got to wear a lot of hats as a director. It's but on, on feature films, uh, the director has got way more. Uh, input than he does on television. Absolutely. In feature films, directors are much more powerful. Yes. So, Mel, I got another question. Uh, do you have a checklist that you use as a director going into a movie? So, so some non-negotiables for you. And I, I don't mean in, in approval. I mean in approach for uh, how you're going to direct a movie. Or, 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 well, movie is probably better. Absolutely, I do. And I... When I have my meeting with people, I let them know this is how I do a movie. This is what I do. Could you and if you just want somebody a, as a rubber stamper, I'm not your person. Got it. And could you share? I have some, a some strong of those? point of view. I'm oh, sorry. Go ahead. I have a strong point of view. I let them know that I have notes that have to be addressed on this script if I'm going to direct this movie. Wow. Yeah, I, I, and I, I, I like you saying point of view. Because I find that in television, uh, increasingly the directors doing television show, not with not a point of view. Uh, he's just doing a point of view. Just the, his point of view is getting the next job, yeah. uh, and he's just trying to just trying to survive and get a good recommendation so he can get his next job. Whereas Mel had a distinct point of view, and he always expressed it perfectly. I thought. Thank you. Yeah. And then I have a sorry, I'm just moving these things. Okay, so this is a this is a sort of a hard question. Um, you get to pick four actors and a storyline of your choosing. What four actors would you choose, and what would the storyline be? Oh my God! You should have given me that as a homework assignment. <laughs> <laughs> That would be, uh, well, I, I can tell you, I would love to work with my psych actors again, you know, James and Dulé. I had a wonderful experience with them. But I, 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 there's no way I can say that because I've had so many great experiences. You know, Shatner, George Clooney, uh, all these amazing, James Mason. Uh, I, there's just no way I could just pick four. Got it. I heard you say that when you worked with Clooney, you knew he was going on to bigger and better things. There was no doubt in your mind. Yeah, when he first when I first worked with him, uh, he was an unknown entity, and then he took off, and now he's directing as well. Yeah, and he's a heck of a director. He's a really good director, I think. Yeah, he's a bright, bright person. Good guy. He's almost sixty years old. Can you imagine that? <laughs> can you imagine that? Uh, yes, Frank, I can. Yeah, I got a ball spot older than George Clooney. Yeah. When you worked with, let's say, you made documentaries, you worked in television, you worked uh, in movies of the week, you worked in film. What's your favorite genre? Now that you've written a play, I mean, what is your favorite genre? 
it's all storytelling. It's all, I, again, I don't have a favorite. Uh, my latest documentary I'm very excited about is a rich man from Seattle who takes a different challenged person to the New York Marathon every year. He created this amazing wheelchair that he pushes 26 miles. He pushes that person. And this year he chose a 19-year-old girl uh, who goes to a drama school in L.A. And she's got all these disabilities. She's not tall at all. Uh, amazing structural issues. And I interviewed him in Seattle. I interviewed her mom in Seattle. I interviewed her at, at AMDA Film School in L.A. And then I went to New York and shot her in the marathon with my iPhone 13 Pro Max. And I got amazing footage. And that's my newest documentary. Wow. And what's the name of that documentary? Mel, is it named yet? Uh, well, that's a, a really good question. I'm not quite sure what I'm going to call it. So yeah. uh, I haven't totally finished it yet. So, You know, you talk about iPhones. Uh, so many young people come to me and say, what can I do to get into the business? Uh, and my answer is very different than it used to be. My answer was you know, follow traditional means, but now my answer is go out and shoot something. If you're passionate well, about it. What did you say? What did you used to say it was? I just follow traditional means, you know, try, oh, try yeah, to become yeah. a PA and work your way up. But now I say go out and shoot something with the iPhones, with the editing systems. Go out and make a 10 minute short if you want. Go out and make something to sell yourself. Absolutely. Uh, uh, it's so much easier now than it has ever been to show that you've really got something. Absolutely. Show them you can tell a story. Yep. Yes. Yep. Uh, are you still active? Uh, you're still active with the DGA? Uh, yes, I am. I'm uh, involved in a, a program where, uh, of, of diversity. Um, I've mentored uh, a, a woman for a few years and now a young Lat American Latino guy from San Antonio, Texas, originally. And I connected him with uh, Todd Harthen, who's also from San Antonio, Texas, one of my writers on Psych, and hopefully he'll get a gig on his show. So, you know, we're trying to make the industry more diverse. So I'm involved with that. And you're still playing golf? Yeah, not that much. You know, I have issues from wrestling and being a catcher in baseball and a linebacker and all that. So I have run a over by an old Jew. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> by Larry Zonka. <laughs> <laughs> Once. <gasps> All they have to do is a beer truck. Yeah. <laughs> My uh, in wrestling, we wrestled in Syracuse, and our I wrestled one seventy seven, and the one ninety one wrestler on my team couldn't do it, and they said, "Mel, do you mind moving up a weight class and wrestling one ninety one?" And I wrestled a guy named Bob Schlendorf, who I'd never been pinned. He beat me 15 to 3, but I was bridging the whole time not to be pinned. And uh, my neck is really screwed up for life because of it. But he became the na nation national champion in his weight class. Wow. You got any closing uh, questions, Billy? No, just uh, just delighted to see that uh, I'm lucky enough, I guess, that that Quinn, uh, Quinn Martin read your, uh, or watched your uh, movie that you made and caught your eye and, and let the advice that you've given young filmmakers to just go out and do it. Stop the bullshit. Put one leg in front of the other and get noticed. That yeah. certainly worked for you. Yeah, no, Frank is making a really good point about that. Like, show, show what you can do as a storyteller. Yeah, don't, don't tell me, show me. Yes. First rule of writing, show me, don't tell me. Well, Mel, you have certainly showed us for 40 years or more what it is to be a good filmmaker. Uh, I want to thank you, thank for, you for being with us today. Uh, we've had a great time. Yeah, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. You well, pleasure, pleasure meeting you. Congratulations on a great body of work there, Mel. Continue success. I hope the play hits a home run. That's for yeah, sure. Yeah, me too. Yeah. Make sure we know when it's going to be, where and when it's going to be. I will let you know for sure. All right. Thank Again, you. I don't know if you heard about this COVID thing, but it's kind of mucked things up a bit. So <laughs> Yeah, well, we're coming out of it.
Yeah. We're so, coming out of it. So fingers crossed. Yep. For sure. Thanks, pal. Good to see you. And okay, I'll, thank you I'll, both. I'll close with pleasure. Good eye, Mel. <laughs> Good eye, <on>, Mel. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect ending. Perfect end. Good kicker. Good kicker. All right. Thanks, pal. Uh, Be take, well. Thank you. Thanks for having me. That sweetheart of a guy. Real nice guy. Yep. Yep. Uh, he, he really is. Pretty modest too, considering the body of work that this guy's put on a uh, across his lifetime. Incredible. Yeah. I mean, it's it's. He is so good that he has survived for 50 years. I mean, you, you you can't say enough about how difficult our business is in to, to survive. I mean, you know, I'm still going at 72. I'm I'm you know way over the hill as far as the contemporary society is good, but I still make a valuable contribution every day, every time I every time I work. Well, and, you you can't hold back talent, Frank. I mean, the talent is just oozing. So that's that's why. You well, in do Mel it. in Mel's in Mel's case, it is. In <laughs> I, Mel's say, case, I think it, I see he had his tongue firmly, firmly put in his cheek yeah. when he said that. And, I I saw it stuck in the side of his cheek. In Mel's <laughs> case, that's true. <laughs> uh, well, you know, obviously they're paying you for a reason, Frank. You know, they they still want you around for a reason. You know. Uh, yeah, but you know, I I usually say I I want to measure this because i want to make sure i know what to say is is if you're an actress you're pretty much done by the time you're 30. if you haven't made it by the time you're 30 you may not make it if you're an actor you may not make it by if you haven't made it by 35 male you're not going to make it i think that as a writer if you hadn't made it by 40 you're not going to make it uh so and if you're a producer if you haven't made it by 50 you're not going to make it so the fact that Mel 75 and still making it uh, has a lot to say for Mel Damsky. Uh, no, I agree with you. If at first you don't succeed, you know, you might as well give up because there's no sense of making a damn movie. <laughs> 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 uh, Try it one more time and then give up. You gave me a great segue. Speaking of making a damn fool of yourself, <laughs> but I don't know how to follow it up. Go anywhere you want. Who, who's been making a damn fool of themselves lately? <laughs> the Trumps, the Trumps are always making a damn fool of themselves for, as far as my I'm favorite concerned. line is the uh, is the instead of saying Gestapo tactics for the chick with the gazpacho tactics, oh. that was the Mexican soup line. That was a, he's using gazpacho tactics. I said they're coming after some Mexican soup. Who What's her that? name? Uh, Marjorie, Marjorie Taylor, Taylor Green. Yeah, Marjorie Taylor. Green. Oh Lord, have mercy on me. I, yeah. I I'm really thinking that these elections will be decided I think by two races. If Herschel Walker wins in Georgia, and if if Ted Cruz wins in Texas over uh, Beto, uh, Beto O'Rourke, yeah, we're fucked. Well, you know what? He's coming out of uh, the uh, observatory last night on my date with my wife, and uh, I saw gas for six twenty-five a gallon. I think we're fucked. What? Six twenty-five a gallon. It was down there by the by the observe Griffin Observatory in L.A. last night. Some places it's seven. Are you guys inferring that uh, the current state of things and the current regime is the appropriate one? I don't know about no, appropriate, but they're no, 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 no. I mean, Again, this is a disaster this is, right now. Th th this is this is the this is the fault with everybody's. You can be critical of Biden, uh -huh. but you can't be critical of Trump. Oh, okay, all right. So I, I you got to meet in the middle someplace. Yeah, yeah. You got to say. Twenty-five percent of what fuck, what Trump did was fucked up. Maybe seventy-five percent of what Trump did was Biden's. At least fifty percent of what he's doing was fucked up. But the partial reason that they're all fucked up is because the Congress won't let them do anything. That That's they, part of it. Yeah. That they I mean, want we live to in a corrupt country. I, I was just going to say it's just more so corruption than anything. And yeah, no I I think corruption is we, yeah. we have a corrupt government. It's just money. Whoever whoever spends the most money, but. I've heard so many comments lately. Biden's the worst president we ever had. The worst. He's not even in office like over a year. But in my his, my memory alone, recent memory, you know, you can make a real good case for George W. Bush. He started two three trillion dollar wars. We lost the whole city of New Orleans. The stock market collapsed. Uh, you know what the best thing that ever happened to George H. W. Bush? George two. Herbert Walker, the old man. No. no. Two, three, four. Donald J. Trump. Yeah. 
Because if you took all the heat off. if you hated George Bush, you detest yeah. Donald Trump. Yeah. Shrub. I used yeah. to call him Shrub. Shrub. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's I think uh, Molly Ivers gave him that nickname. But yeah, I mean, look at the the whole stock market collapsed. Two three trillion dollar wars that we couldn't win to begin with. Impossible. Got involved in it. World Trade Center collapsed on his watch. The city of New Orleans disappeared under his watch. Yeah, but he didn't have anything to do with the hurricane. I, I'm not a George Bush fan. It's how you handle he, a hurricane. It's not the hurricane uh, itself. The, he uh, said the, it. the hurricane yeah. was done by the time he got involved. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, I mean, the fact that uh, Biden inherited that, uh, well, inflation if you flood the city, if you flood the country with money, if you give out money because it's necessary, the people that are going to spend it, and then you have COVID, which shuts down corporations all over the world or shuts down the working class, you're going to have money in search of products, and that's going to be inflation. That's just common sense. You don't have to be an economist, a macroeconomist, or a microeconomist to know that a flood of money searching for products is going to cause inflation, right? So regardless if he was in or Trump was in, there'd be inflation right now. Without a doubt. I mean, I'm not getting them off the hook. The buck stops there. But as far as being the worst president that ever lived. No, he's by far not the worst president that ever lived. That's like, that's kind of a. We live in a presidency when Millard Fillmore was the president. <laughs> way, way back. <laughs> Andrew Johnson. Andrew, Andrew Jackson. Uh, and Andrew Johnson. And Andrew Johnson. Yeah, I mean, you know. And like I said, you can make a good case for Shrub. And Jimmy Carter. Jimmy, yeah. Car Jimmy Carter is. is maligned, but I think history is borne out to him that he's a good man and a pretty pretty good president. He was a good man, and, and, and he got a bad rap because inflation went through the roof under him, but he was paying for the Vietnam War. Yeah. The check came due when he got into office. So you can blame a lot of his Democratic predecessors for that, as you can for you know this situation going on now in the Ukraine. A lot of that's under the Clinton administration. You know what I mean? That they, they had an opportunity after the, the, the Iron Curtain came down to, to do something. And instead, they were more aggressive towards Russia. You know, get more people in NATO, get closer to their borders. And it's understandable why the Russians are a bit paranoid about that. 20 million, you know? Yeah. Let me ask Derek a question. Amen. Why exactly are we wearing these headsets? It's the same question I'm asking for, for a year and a half. I can hear better without the headsets. You definitely can hear better. But... But uh, the reason why you wear the headsets is two reasons. One is so you don't cut off the person that you're speaking with. The second reason is it creates a more intimate environment. And I'm speaking off camera. Uh, and you got shitty looking ears, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's the main reason. Your fucking ears look like shit. Um, but yeah. I, 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 I think these... The, I, I mean, it looks good on TV. It looks good on the show. It look, makes us look like... <laughs> yeah, I kind of like it. Yeah, it gives you the, uh... makes me look like Ed Edward R. Murrow or something. <laughs> oh, I was sitting in the front seat of an airplane, you know. Yeah. You ever been in the kids in the locker room there, son? You, <laughs> <laughs> you ever been in the men's locker room? <laughs> you know, you know what's interesting is I have my list of questions here. Yeah. And it, it just so happened that you guys talked about the iPhone because that was my third question: was uh, do you <coughs> think you could make a good movie with an iPhone? I, I found it interesting that uh, absolutely, yeah, yeah. You, you're making feature films with iPhones. Yeah. Yeah. You know, just don't don't tell me, show me. Go out and fucking make a movie. Right. And I guess, well, you know, you you know, it's a, if you took an iPhone, you'd have to get innovative with like a like a cam or something like that get on a fucking on a innovative different angles in, you and i would have to get innovative my granddaughter is three is two she's already turning it on and off and going around it i think any 15 year old can make a movie they have the technical capabilities to do everything this camera's qualified to do do you agree i do agree in in, in fact there is a there's a group of kids like four or five kids that did a remake of of uh of black panther mm -hmm. but, but with like you know like household ho household items as as uh as costumes and it was it was actually pretty interesting yep so so what household items as costumes like I mean. like you know uh, uh paper towels and, and tupperware oh. and <laughs> stuff like that so uh, we should probably check that out
Well, wh why don't you get it for us the next time? I will. I'll pull it up for you. Yeah, guys. give okay. us a yeah. minute of it. Take a look yeah. at it. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. All right. I think that's done. We've done enough damage for you one day. You think we've wrecked enough havoc? Well, we, you know, we're not running amok anymore, Frank. We're walking amok. <laughs> we're walking amok. <laughs> we're done running amok. No, no. Sometimes I can still run. I've seen, yeah, I've seen him run. I can still I've run. So, sometimes. When well, you're running out to beat a check or something. When I'm, <laughs> when I'm running, to, running for the restroom. <laughs> That's for sure. All right, folks. Thanks you All right, so thanks much for, for being with us. Appreciate it. We'll, we'll see you next week. Go out and shoot a film. Don't talk about it. Next week's guest, retired president of Warner Brothers Film, Steve Papazian.